Welcome to this lecture. The topic today is going to be on measures to prolong plateau duration. Okay, we saw that typically oil and gas fields, they are uh, often produced in plateau mode, meaning that if I plot the rate of the field, either if it's an oil field or if it's a gas field, it will have a shape like this versus time typically have a build-up period in which wells are drilled wells are put in production then i have a, a, a period in which i have a constant production that might be relatively short for oil fields let's say from one to four years but it's relatively long for gas fields uh, let's say something between 10 and 30 years and that depends on the contracts. I have uh, gas contracts with customers. And at the end of this plateau period, I have usually tail production or decline. So this time where we go from here to here, that's what we call the plateau period. Okay, or we call it plateau duration. And in this lecture, I'm going to discuss some measures that we can apply on our production system to prolong plateau duration. So first let's start with our generic production system that we have one well. I'm going to assume just take the one well, although we know that in, in, in general we are going to have many wells. So we have reservoir pressure, we have flowing bottom hole pressure, then we have the wellhead and the Christmas tree in which we have this collection of valves, the master valve, the wind valve, the swap valve. At this point we have the wellhead pressure. Okay, then we have the choke. And then typically we have uh, a collection of flow lines, pipelines, that they take the production from the well and they take it to the separator. Okay, but we are going to uh, put here just one pipeline that is representing all of that. And here we have feed separator. Here we have pressure, let's call it yeah, the inlet of the pipe. And just let's make the clarification that here we have from reservoir to bottom hole, we have the queue of the well. Also in the tubing, we have the queue of the well. Also through the choke, we typically have the queue of the well. But on the flow lines and pipelines, I have another rate that is queue of the pipeline. Yeah, and Q of the pipeline usually takes is a sum of certain number of wells that are produced into that pipeline. Yeah, and it might be also a, uh, a if, if for example that pipeline is carrying the production of the whole field, that will be the Q of the field. So to make it more abstract, let's see we can represent this with a diagram that says reservoir. From reservoir we flow to bottom hole. From bottom hole I flow to wellhead, from wellhead I flow to pipe inlet, and then from pipe inlet I'm going to flow to separator. And in all this process I actually have to pay a toll, I have to loss pressure, uh, energy losses, and that's essentially reflected in the loss in pressure, the pressure is being reduced. When I flow from reservoir pressure to bottom hole, then when I flow from bottom hole to wellhead, then when I flow from wellhead to the inlet of the pipe, and then from the pipe to the separator. Let's put here the type of flow we have. Okay, here we have formation, then we have here is tubing flow, then we have here, this is choke flow, and here we have pipe. So we can represent this energy loss as a, as a most important, uh, the most important component, which is the delta P. So this will be called drawdown. This we call delta P of the tubing. This one, the delta P of the choke this one, the delta P of the pipeline.
So when we are in plateau mode, we want to calculate, typically what happens in plateau mode is that I, the choke is my control element, so then I go from the reservoir all the way to the position upstream the choke, to the wellhead, and I have the rate, the rate is, um, the rate is, um, the rate is fixed, okay, because I'm producing in plateau mode, so then I calculate the pressure available at the at the inlet of the choke. That pressure typically is going to be reduced with time because reservoir pressure typically is reduced with time, depending if uh, how 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 strongly it's going to go with time. That depends on the type of uh, support I have in the reservoir. If I have, for example, aquifer support, if I have injection, and then I have at the inlet of the pipe, I have to go from the other boundary, which is fixed, which is separator pressure. I have the rate, which will be constant again because we are producing at plateau mode and then you calculate the pressure at the inlet of the pipe. So during the life of the field, P in is going to, if we're going to plot these two pressures, okay, we have one which is separator pressure, typically P in is going to remain constant because the rate is constant and this guy is constant and uh, the pressure at the wellhead will typically go down. Okay. So on this difference that we have here is the delta P of the choke. This delta P of the choke is what I, that means that I have to reduce it with time. Okay. Initially I have a lot of energy and I don't need that much, but with time is getting reduced. So that means that I have to open the choke in this direction. I have to open and reduce the delta P of the choke. So from this uh, chart, you can see that actually what drives the end of the plateau is when these two guys meet, when this will be plateau end, P plateau. So one way you could think about how to, you want to prolong the plateau, is simply if you want to make um, if you want to make um, these pressure losses that I have here, because I want to make the available pressure, I want to make it higher. Okay, like if we are going to take exactly this this diagram, so we're going to say reservoir uh, wellhead pressure, available wellhead pressure. Maybe we want to make it something like this in time that it will decline like that in time. Okay, this is wellhead pressure. Okay, and then you see that the point at which it intersects is actually later in time and then we have an extension of the plateau okay be sure this is not pressure with rate but this is pressure with time we know that this one is going down therefore this one is going down with time okay but this one however is remaining constant because the rate is constant so this is and this is the difference between them if i reduce the pressure drop along the system when you go from reservoir all the way to uh, wellhead, that means that I can, uh, the wellhead pressure will be equal to the inlet pressure of the pipe at a later time. Another trick I could make is also I could lower the delta P in this pipe. Okay, if I lower, reduce the pressure drop in the pipe, then this curve, for example, will, let's use a green color, okay, might be that now. Now P in looks like that. It will be still constant. So now I managed to, for example, put a bigger pipe and then now the intersection will be with this curve will be at a later time. If I, and if I do both, actually I have a quite a good increase in plateau duration. So the, the conclusion is that if essentially is reduced to prolonged plateau, I have to take measures to reduce the energy losses in the system. And to reduce it means essentially to reduce the delta P that I have between all parts. And also the conclusion is that not only helps if you do it upstream the choke, but it also helps if you do it downstream the choke. Okay, because that pressure will become smaller and then that means that you can choke for longer time. Or if you do something in this part of the system, the drawdown, the tubing, then that means that this pressure will be higher. 
Okay, and then the, the choke has to be closed for longer time. So let's see some measures that we can take for um, to reduce delta P. Yeah, let's go one by one. Maybe we start with the uh, deformation, delta P go down. Okay, if we take a look at the dry gas back pressure equation, low pressure back pressure equation, we see CR PR squared minus PWF squared to the power of 10. Okay, we see that, uh, for example, uh, here we were saying that this is, if you are in plateau rate, this is constant. Okay, this one is a, um, a reducing and therefore that's why if you want to keep the rate actually this one also has to be reduced okay this one is going down this one is constant so therefore this has to be reduced this is like a proxy this 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 part here it's not exactly the same but it's exactly a proxy to delta p <coughs> drawdown okay more or less so one option we have here to reduce that delta P is actually to, for the same rate, we can simply increase, do something to this guy. We can increase the productivity of the well. Yeah, and that typically I can do, for example, with stimulation. I can do with acidizing. I can do with fracking. Improving the connectivity of the well with the formation. Here I have in this coefficient, I typically have permeability, I have the height of the layer, I can do a recompletion. That means, for example, to perforate in a, this uh, longer section of reservoir. Uh, I can also try to do side tracking. Okay, to, to maybe enable, if I have side tracking, if I see the wellbore, how it looks like, it might be that I have two um, multilaterals okay so that those are ways that I can uh, reduce that delta P okay another way that I can do it is actually if you look at this equation that I have here another way I can do this will be reduced if this guy is reduced so how do I reduce the well rate Okay, we know that the Q field is more or less something like the Q well times the number of wells. Okay, so if in that case I want to make this guy smaller, then simply I have to increase the number of wells. And that means simply drilling more wells. Okay. If I drill more wells, then uh, this guy can be smaller for the same Q field, okay? And if this guy is smaller, then this delta P is smaller. That means that the pressure I will have at the bottom hole will be higher. So this is a, a summary of all the things we can do with the drawdown. Now let's see what happens with the tubing. Okay. There are a few things that I cannot change in the tubing. For example, if you remember, if we are going to use again the analogy of the, the equation, the dry gas tubing equation, we have QG is equal to CT PWF squared divided by QBS minus PWH squared 0.5. Okay, if you remember, you just have to, I have here, this is a number and this gives me some delta, delta P. Again, this is like a proxy, not exactly the same, but this is somehow proportional to delta P uh, tubing. So if I want to reduce this guy, then I have either to reduce that guy, okay, that could be doing drilling more wells, but I can also increase that guy. So how to increase CT? Okay, CT has a lot of things inside, if you remember, has uh, a, uh, a standard condition pressure and temperature, has the, uh, the some things that we cannot change. For example, in a well, we cannot change the true vertical depth. 
so we cannot change the height difference we usually cannot change also the uh, the measure depth the MD we cannot change it that much but we have something very important there that we can change which is the diameter okay which is the most dominant uh, factor in the CT okay, because it's to the power let me just bring my components here We said that C is all of these. Okay, you have S, which S depends on the height, it depends on the temperature. Okay, but you see here you have actually one very important factor, which is this diameter into the pipe. So that's one of the main things we can do to you know, on the tubing. Okay, the, I'm using the, the example of dry dry gas, but actually this applies for multiphase, applies for oil that you simply increase the diameter and then you reduce the delta P. Okay, but let's now go a bit on a sidetrack uh, just to talk about how to define tubing size. Okay, and there are a few things that I want to, there are actually two main factors that I have to balance out. So one of them is uh, get more rate Okay, and the other factor is um, keep cost low. Okay, a high high diameter tubing will be more costly. Okay, but also a high diameter tubing usually gives you higher production, allows you to produce more. So that's a, a trade-off I have to consider. And if you let's let's to make an example, we're going to consider a well. We have a, um, the simply saying that is very close to a separator and we have no choke and we're going to plot here the bottom hole pressure okay because there is no choke wellhead pressure is constant and equal to p separator okay? and we have the arc so then we are going to plot pwf versus qg and here we have the IPR, which let's say is going to look like that if it's a dry gas well. This is the IPR. And then we uh, plug also the TPR. This is the uh, bottom hole pressure for wellhead pressure in one. Okay. And also for diameter one. Now, if I increase the diameter, when I have no flow, actually, this, the initial point is the same. Uh, the diameter doesn't affect actually the hydrostatic uh, column okay, that you have here. If you, as long as you have the same wellhead pressure here, PWH1, then I will have always the same uh, static. If I have no flow rate, I will have the same static pressure here, okay, which will be this one here. Now, when I start, when I start increasing the rate, actually what happens is that a bigger diameter tubing a bigger tubing diameter will actually allow me to the velocity will be less okay so phi small phi sorry big diameter big diameter gives you a small gas velocity okay and that gives you small a um, friction factor and that also gives you small delta p okay so in, in conclusion, the curve looks something like this. Okay, this will be for the same wellhead pressure, but now for a diameter 2, where diameter 2 is bigger than diameter 1. So that means if you see the intersection, if I, if I put these two tubing together, okay, I was going to get this right here, QG1. But now if I put these two systems together, the, the green and the red, now I obtain QG2 okay. and it's also the opposite if I use a smaller tubing size then I, I end up with something like that
This is the same wellhead pressure. All of them depart from the same place. The hydrostatic component is not affected. So I have here phi 3, okay, with phi 3 being less than phi 1. So from there you can see very clearly that actually a higher diameter gives you a higher rate. And that's something I have to be um, G3 very aware of. But sometimes it comes a point where I, no matter how much I increase the diameter, let's switch color this color, okay? You see here, for example, there might be some diameters that actually give you a very minimal. This would be QG4, okay? QW8, one, P4 is greater than P2, okay? So, it, but it gives you, for example, let's say this one is very, very costly, okay? This diameter is very, very costly, but it doesn't give you that much gas, additional gas. So it's a trade-off that we have to find out a proper diameter that gives me a, a significant increase in gas rate, or at least uh, that will allow me to produce plateau rates for longer time, but at the same time that is not that is not costly. So just to bring another example in the plan for development and operations presented by uh, Energian for the Carishan Tanin field, you can find this figure. And what we're looking here, we need maybe to explain a bit how, how to do it. So what they have done here is that this curve contains both, this is IPR plus CPR. Okay. So this is if we have a well, we have our formation, we have PR, we have PWF, and we have P wellhead. So they, departing from here, they go with this between PR and PWF with IPR and they go from PWF to P wellhead with uh, the Cuban equation. So when you do that, you are going to obtain, so this will be wellhead pressure versus the Q of the well. And when you have no flow, simply you have a reservoir pressure minus the hydrostatic head. Okay, so this is reservoir pressure minus delta P hydrostatic. But as soon as you start to having any flow, so then it's not only the hydrostatic, but then I have the, um, the uh, frictional, okay, minus delta P frictional. This one is zero for QG equals zero. Okay, so that's why we end up with a curve looking like that. So what happens here, so this is what we call the wellhead performance relationship. Okay. And it gives me the available pressure at the wellhead uh, calculated co-current from the reservoir for a given rate, Q of the well. So now what happens in with this equation if I increase uh, the diameter size. So remember the diameter size doesn't do anything to this hydrostatic part but it does to the friction. If I increase the diameter then I will have less friction and the curve might look something like that. Okay so this is the curve for PR. This will be for PR1. This will be for PR1 but now this will be for diameter 2 which is greater than diameter 1. And this is for diameter 1. And also the opposite way, if I have a smaller tubing, then that means that my curve now will be PR1, but for P3, which is actually less than P1. Okay, and that's exactly what is shown here. You have the two green, they're for the same reservoir pressure, Kadish well, seven inch and 5.5 .5 inch. So the, this one, the dotted line is a smaller tubing than the continuous line. Both should meet actually, I don't know why they didn't put it here, but those sh should meet at the same point because the hydrostatic pressure doesn't affect, is not affected by diameter. And this one is for seven inch and this one is for 5.5 .5 inch. And all the other curves, they are for other reservoir pressures. Here you have 500, for example. So this one is for reservoir pressure of 500. 
and tubing of 5 inch and this other is for the same reservoir pressure of 500 but tubing size of 5.5 inch so that's one consideration we have to make when uh, when selecting tubing okay, we have to make sure that we have enough that doesn't affect significantly the performance but at the same time we don't want to make it so big that really we have to go to a very big size just to get a difference in performance okay. another consideration we have to make is we have to consider is uh, completion considerations Okay, typically we have in our wells they are made with the production casing okay which is which is nine and five eight and if sometimes if that's the case well simply my tubing size has to be smaller than nine and five eight okay but sometimes I also have some liner some place hang some place in in the well okay that could be a liner that could be a smaller size and if I want to send the tubing through it, then of course my tubing size has to be smaller than where I want to send it through. Okay. So as completion consideration, simply that the tubing has to fit. It should be able not only to fit, but you should be able to run the tubing into the, into the completion. Another consideration which is a bit related is about the tubing handle. Okay, let's take this one, turn on to another page. Okay, so as we mentioned, the tubing is typically hanged on, and we are going to see what do we mean by hang, but this we have the production casing and the tubing is actually hanged that means that all the weight of the tubing is is transferred to this production casing and that is done with a component called uh, tubing uh, tubing hanger which we're going to put here is like a wedge and that wedge has simply because of this wedge type then all the weight that it has here the tubing is placed is screwed someplace to into this uh, and here I have a passage of the fluid to go through this hanger okay. uh, all of this weight is transferred to the production casing and if you remember in well construction actually we have after the production casing we have the intermediate casing Okay, and the intermediate casing is doing exactly so the production casing is putting all the weight on the intermediate casing then we have the surface casing okay and then the weight of the tubing plus the weight of the production casing plus the weight of the intermediate casing is laying on the uh, surface casing and then finally we have our conductor Okay, and then the conductor is actually receiving most of the weight from the tubing, from the production casing, from the intermediate casing, from the surface casing. Um, to that. So let, let's put here some the conductor. This is a surface casing. This is uh, intermediate casing. And this one here is the production casing. So the conclusion is that we need the tubing hanger just to be able to transfer the weight of the tubing to the production casing. And it's a disc, if you see it from the top, we can say it's simply almost like a block, like a disc. Okay, we hatch, it has the hole for the tubing. The problem is that this pipe doesn't, this hanger doesn't only have the tubing. Okay, this is the tubing for where you thread it okay you also have the annular access to have access to the annular because this is going to be uh, lower we typically have another hole here so let's make it with this green color 
and we have a piece of pipe which is maybe a few hundred meters long uh, 10 or 100 meters long and this is the annular access uh, pipe and then we have to make another hole here this is annular annulus annular okay then we have other things remember in a well we also have the subsurface safety valve which if something happens in the surface is going to close and leave all the well uh, uh, safely uh, safely hey, um, is going to leave the well safely uh, with no flow okay it is going to be safely closed so for that case to keep this one open all the time because if it, something happens then you cut the hydraulic fluid and then this one is not doesn't get any energy anymore and then it's going to close to keep it open then you use another hole in the tubing hanger which is a kind of a hydraulic a capillary for hydraulic fluid so this will be this has the name of sssv is sub surface safety valve and i'm going to put a link to how this uh, valve uh, we have one in our department and you can have uh, see a video watch a video how it works but essentially it has to be with fluid all the time so this is the capillary capillary tube for hydraulic fluid and then you have one more hole here so this is the SSSV then you have might have another hole if you have a gauge someplace in the uh, this is a pressure gauge something very common in the in the offshore in the Norwegian continental shelf I have a bottom hole pressure gauge and then I have to let's use this color maybe we have to make another hole to pass that line okay that will be gauge. Okay. then I have other things that could be for example a um, I'm running out of colors but it could be, for example, I have an um, injection, I have, uh, we will talk about it a bit later, but we have some injection of some chemicals in the, in, in the tubing. Okay, for example, we have here and we have a mandrel, another thing for chemical injection. And then we have one more hole, so this is chemical. so the conclusion is that we have we have our hanger so that has a lot of holes and the hanger actually has to have a structural integrity to be able to transfer the weight to the next okay otherwise if it has too many holes then it becomes weak and cannot support and it will simply collapse so simply you have to say um, do to the structural integrity of the tubing hanger tubing diameter might be limited okay so that's one consideration regarding the diameter of the tubing there are also a few more that we're going to cover um, so one is the erosional velocity okay. and erosion happens if I have uh, for example uh, sand particles and they start to impinge on the on the tubing wall if the gas goes too fast let's say this is a tubing wall and the gas goes too fast or the liquid goes too, too fast so I have impingement and then I have loss of material that is going to be taken out by the flow. The impingement of, of particles that uh, due to the high speed I will have removal and this is going to cause a problem because I, I need to guarantee certain thickness of this tubing for, to avoid leakages, also for structural reasons, um, etc. 
So what I say is that the velocity of the gas has to be less than some erosional velocity. Okay, less or equal than uh, erosional velocity. And uh, the actually this velocity of gas, it's uh, a bit difficult to, de to define it, but essentially we are going to say is a Q of gas local. Okay, this is a pressure and temperature divided by the cross-section area of the pipe. Cross-section area of tubing. And if we want to want to use more like um, nomenclature for multiphase flow, actually we don't call that gas velocity, but we call that BSG is a superficial gas velocity. Okay, because we are assuming that actually the gas is occupying all of the volume, um, all of the cross section volume. When we know that's not correct, we typically have oil and gas, o uh, oil and water also circulating. So we maybe call this superficial gas velocity. Uh, for example, let me show you how the expression looks like. This is from API. So we have some standards to define the, to calculate this limit. Okay, so we have standards to define the erosional. Okay, we have one standard called the API 14E that looks a bit like that. So we have the erosional velocity is a constant, which is empirical, and then you have a density of the mixture that you calculate uh, making some assumptions. Okay, for example, density of the mixture could be density of the mixture is the density of the oil plus Q oil divided by Q oil plus Q uh, gas plus density of the gas times Q gas divided by Q oil plus Q gas. Okay, and if you have water, for example, you do the same the density of water Q water divided by Q oil plus Q gas plus Q water. Okay, you need to add here also gas or water, sorry. That should be done. And note that these rates, they are actually local rates, okay? We, if you remember, we have a transformation relationship between local rates, so Q gas local at any pressure and temperature is equal to the Q gas at standard conditions times Bg at that pressure and temperature. And the same applies to oil at pressure and temperature is equal to the standard condition rate of oil times BO at pressure and temperature. And the same thing applies for simply a transformation factor that I have between standard conditions and local conditions. Yeah, you also have another standard, which is the one that is mostly used in Norway, which is the recommended practice uh, 0503, 0501, sorry, BMV. Uh, but it's very similar to the API, but they have some more uh, accurate numbers for it to calculate the, the factors. Okay. But it's very similar. So this is one thing that you have to design your tubing such that your velocity because you have here this cross-section area, so if you make it very, very small, this one will be very, very high, and then you're going to have problems of erosion. Okay, another thing, another uh, problem that we might have is in gas wells, then the velocity of the gas must be higher than the critical liquid loading velocity. Okay, and gas wells, if we put here the cross-section of a gas well, typically not only produce gas, but also they have some liquids coming either for, from water that drops out. Okay, some water that drops out. 
or also some condensate, maybe some condensate that I have. So it's, it's transporting these gases. Also, you have a lot of liquid and it can be transported in droplets or it can be also transported in, uh, in a film next to the wall. So the gas has to have enough energy to move those particles up. If it doesn't have those droplets up, if it doesn't have enough energy, then those droplets won't be transported together with the gas and they will start to accumulate in parts of the tubing. So you might have a situation in which the tubing looks more like, like some lumps of gas and then you have liquid in between, which is not good because then the pressure drop increases dramatically. Okay, it's very different to have this flow in which the pressure drop is, is, is low, but in this flow actually the pressure drop is going to be very high, simply because the density of the mixture here is actually greater than the density of the mixture into, okay, this is density of the mixture into. <coughs> So this situation, what we have here is what we call liquid loading. And a, um, there is a velocity or a very famous um, criteria called Turner criteria, where a mass uh, force balance is made on the droplet. You have P, uh, F due to weight. You have F due to buoyancy. And then you have an F due to drag. You make a force balance even though we know here from this drawing that actually we have some part of the liquid transported on the wall. There are also some models that take that into account. But essentially we have a, um, a drag, we make a force balance on the, on the droplet and from there we determine what is the minimum from there you obtain from this force balance you obtain, this is the VS gas, okay, or B gas. Okay, and from here you obtain the critical gas velocity. Okay, and then you say that your gas velocity has to be greater or equal than that critical gas velocity. And that's a checkup you have to make for all uh, points in the tubing. Okay, so that's what we call liquid loading. So it doesn't simply say that I can make the tubing as big as I can because if, if phi is big, then Vg is small and then it could happen that Vg falls below the critical gas velocity. Okay, so I have to make sure that for the whole life of the field that my gas velocity is higher than the, leak, than the critical gas velocity. Okay, so that's, I think, all considerations I had to make um, for, for the tubing, for when, how do you decide the, the size of the tubing? Okay, so this was this discussion also copy this okay, actually it was a kind of a long discussion but I think it's uh, important to put it uh, then we have on the tubing we can also do other things we can put artificial lift okay which could be gas lift by doing the same idea, the density of the mixture, I put gas, then I reduce it, may, may make it more gas-like, then the delta P will be less. Okay, then I can have a jet pump. I can have also a plunger lift. I can have, a, I have other ways in which I simply add energy to the fluid. I don't make it lighter. I don't make it easier to flow, but simply I add energy, for example, rod pumping. Okay, or I have a um, progressive cavity pumps. Or I have also electric submersible pumps. This is 
equal ESP and this is called PCP. Let me move this to the and then one last comment I want to make for the tubing, it could be that uh, the tubing uh, has a, um, let me just let me put this here also, it should be part of this, right? Another thing we have to consider is that uh, the diameter of the tubing could be reduced in time, okay? for example due to scaling we're going to talk about that a bit later but we have here one uh, picture how it looks like it has a choke but essentially in the tubing we have the same the same phenomena we have some minerals that are in the water that they the solubility becomes uh, smaller so they come out they precipitate and then they attach to the pipe wall and then with time they end up actually plugging and closing, um, making it smaller and smaller. Okay, that's something that happens also in, in houses, in, in the water from home, that you can get sometimes some white accumulation. It's essentially coming out of solution and then it's accumulating and then reducing the cross section. You also have other things. You can have a wax and asphaltine is not that common but it can happen also in the tubing we have here i think a uh, how it looks like okay here we have one which is a famous photo by statoy that's a uh, wax plug so we can have the same thing this happens usually uh, in in the on the flow lines but also can happen in in the tubing so i need to have a scraper okay so my point is that when you have these problems that you might have a restriction due to scaling wax asphaltine then you go and have to clean it okay for example for need to again move all of these to the left okay for example for the scale if I have a tubing and then it has a scale build up inside that is restricting the diameter I could go and do a milling operation in which I come and I simply use some drill bit to remove that um, that uh, um, those accumulations I could also use chemicals to remove the scale depending which type of scale it is or in these asphaltines also I can try to scrap it uh, with some there are some wax uh, asphaltine scrappers that I can use okay. I, I don't think they're much used in the North Sea but they are used other places in the world okay so I put a scraper and then I, I scrap the, um, the tubing So here I should say these are measures to mitigate phenomena that cause, let's, let's remove all of these measures to mitigate phenomena that causes tubing, di tubing diameter to be reduced in time. Okay, so then we have been to through the formation, through the tubing, uh, choke simply I just open as much as I need, but then the pipeline and in the pipeline I have a similar okay so let me put it here delta P of the pipeline 
we have a, it, the pipeline behaves in a similar way as the tubing. If you remember, we didn't have that many things to change there. Okay, we have all of that. So actually we don't have the length. We can try to make the pipeline shorter if it's possible, but actually we can increase the diameter We can a, uh, make uh, a parallel pipeline, install a parallel pipeline. Okay, it's the same reason if we take the equation of the pipeline, the simplified equation for horizontal pipeline for dry gas, we see P in minus P out squared and to the power of 0.5. So if we have some rates for the pipe, then simply by putting two pipes, dividing bad rate by two, then I can reduce the delta P. This is a proxy, or this is similar to delta P across the pipe. Okay. We can say not similar, but maybe say it's proportional to, to the delta P on the pipe. Okay, this is very costly and we only should consider depending on the length of the pipe is if it's really necessary and this is also very very costly increase the diameter and when I'm doing it from design uh, so let's put here another one last comment is considerations for choosing a pipe diameter so we have the same considerations we have erosion also we have a, uh, a heat transfer. We know that um, if we look at the, at the cross section of the pipe, okay, we have here the temperature of the fluid. Here we have a temperature of the ambient. And we have some flow heat from the fluid. Usually it's hotter than the ambient, okay? especially when you are in the subsea or when you're flowing in the pipe. So this Q, actually I can express it as a function of U. This is a heat transfer coefficient. And because it's taking all of the layers in between, I might have the, the steel, I might have some insulation, okay? I might have a lot of layers in between, I might have the, the soil, uh, if it's buried, I might have the, um, the water. So this is the overall heat transfer coefficient. Then I have the perimeter of the pipe. Okay, then I have the length of that section and then I have TF minus T ambient. Okay, so TF, T ambient is, is usually the same. Uh, the heat transfer coefficient changes a bit with the size, but you see here, you see a big effect of the size. Okay, so the bigger size, big diameter, then leads to big, usually to big Q. Okay, and this big Q leads also to low TF, temperature of the fluid. Okay, it's going to drain more energy and then TF is going to go down. And, and simply this causes issues because I can have in, in uh, can, can have liquid dropout in gas systems. We are going to see now, was that a problem that related to this um, one of these uh, issues and then we can have a wax uh, appearance in oil uh, pipes okay. uh, we can have also hydrate okay hydrate essentially is like an ice type molecule that is formed uh, due to low temperature and combination of uh, water and uh, light uh, hydrocarbon molecules. Uh, we can also have high oil viscosity, which makes it more difficult to flow. Okay. Then the last point uh, is uh, a liquid accumulation in gas. Uh, pipeline. 
Okay, so if, uh, if you see, let's take a cross section of a gas pipe, and of, of course we assume it's not exactly horizontal, but we have some, usually we have some inclination. We have the gas flowing, and if you remember, let's say Bg, velocity of the gas, if we have typically also some liquid coming with that gas, it can be condensate, can be some water, etc. So the velocity of the gas has to be big enough to carry all of that particles through the system. Okay, if it's not big enough, that means that the diameter is maybe is too big. Okay, then we will have to we will start having accumulation of liquid some places along the system, and this can cause occlusion or closure of the pipe. Then what this causes is that the pressure, for example, at this stage, if if you for example have a blockage, okay, then you have the pressure is increasing, and then all of a sudden it will push has a slug, okay, what we call a slug, liquid slug, might be created in the pipe. And that means if I have a long pipe, and then I have a separator, if I'm going to monitor here at the separator the Q of the liquid that I get with time, I may get a, a relatively constant amount, but then I have a big jump when the plug comes, and then I have again a, a low amount, and then I have a big plug, and then I have a low amount. And this is very difficult for separators to, to handle because they also occur in a very quick time. Okay, for example, in the separator, we were looking before, we're going to assume just two phases. Okay, we have our separator, which is designed for a given level. Okay, here we have a, so let's say we're making it as a floater that allows me to control the liquid, and then we have a pressure transducer that allows me to control. Here we have a valve for the gas. So it could be a problem, it can cause a uh, lot of nasty issues on So it can cause a lot of uh, sorry. this is a pressure and transistor that is going to be connected to Directly, we have a control system, so we, sh we are not plotting the control system, but essentially that's controlling that. So we have that if, for example, at this inlet, we start to get these slugs, okay, liquid, no liquid, liquid, no liquid. It could be very difficult for the separator to, to control it, okay, especially if it comes very fast, you suddenly have a big amount of liquid additional liquid that is going to overflow and appear on your separator, then that's that's very critical. In the separator, if you remember, we have a few levels, okay, like you have here, it's, uh, this stands for, this is normal liquid level. Okay, then you have the, uh, low alarm level uh, sorry level alarm level alarm low low and this is level alarm low And here we have level alarm high, high. Okay. So typically when the liquid just reaches this uh, level alarm high, that means that it's going to give a warning to the operator that some action has to be taken swiftly. But if already reaches to the high, high, then it has uh, automatically starts a shutdown protocol. 
So one thing that could happen with the separator is that if you cannot, the batch or the volume of liquid is big and then cannot be accepted or cannot be processed or cannot be tackled by the control system, then it might drive, it might uh, drive the whole system to do a shutdown, on plan shutdown because of these locks. Okay, can lead to overpressure, can lead to a lot of bad things. So you need to be careful with what diameter you use also to ensure that you don't have liquid accumulation. Okay, liquid accumulation can lead to high delta P in the pipe. Okay, can create slugs, can create unstable production and it's, it's very non-desirable. Uh, non okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Measures to prolong flotel duration. A lot of considerations that have to be taken, but essentially reducing the delta P along the system. And I have some measures that I can apply for that. Some of them are most cost effective than others. And there are a lot of technical considerations to, to take into account. Thank you. Bye bye.